uh, this is important material for for everybody, but for the world today, and then obviously a, a you know a a personal uh, matter for our church right now that we'll talk more about at the end of uh, end of the message. Uh, but I've got a message here that I started yesterday, and basically this is part two of the message, which is uh, base. Uh, this is just the title: marriage, fornication, adultery. And remarriage. Okay, so yesterday in Iola, if you didn't get a chance to listen to it, uh, you know, I talked on about marriage and fornication. That's the first half of the of the subject matter. And again, not a super exciting message. My intent wasn't to you know impress anybody or to preach hard or anything like that. I just want people to learn this and to understand this. There's some things that I'm even uh, still considering and processing myself. Uh, on this subject matter, okay? So yesterday, I want to just kind of get you up to speed. If you haven't listened to that message, I do still encourage you to go back and listen to it. Uh, it's on the uh, YouTube uh, page for uh, Iola Baptist Temple in Iola. Uh, but basically, here's what I covered. Uh, and I'm seriously going to abbreviate this. Uh, so you'll have to go to that sermon to get any more details. But I covered why we have natural sexual desires. Okay, and obviously it's it's if you really break it down and you think about it simplistically, it makes so much sense. Okay, God made mankind. You know, He made a man, and then obviously we know that He took from that man His rib, created a woman. I mean, they were the only man and woman in this world. You know, He had a, a certain. You know, you would think since it's part of His body, it's literally bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. You know, He had a certain attachment. To, in love for that woman, you know, it says that, you know, it wasn't good for the man to be alone. So here he provided this companion. He provided uh, somebody who he could love. He provided also a help that was meet for him. You know, the wife was to be a help to him. And so he provided all these things in that relationship. And I brought this up yesterday as well. So unholy sexual, I uh, say, no, no, unholy unnatural sexual desires uh, would include something that, uh, you know, somebody who has towards somebody other than a person that can fulfill that role. Now, let me ask you this. Could a man and a man be friends? Or a woman and a woman, could they be friends? Of course they could. Could that be, could that provide a companion for you? Yes. Could they be a help one to another? Yes, a man and a man, woman and woman, they, they could be a help towards one another. They could be like Jonathan and David and be attached and knit at the soul, right? Just like soul uh, brothers or whatever, soul sisters. And, and, and it's all those things we can find in, a, in, in that kind of relationship. But God wanted a man and a female to come together in a special way that nobody can fulfill any, any other way. And, and so he put within us a natural desire, a natural attraction to the opposite sex. And look, it's not, it's, it's, it's not, it's not brain surgery. A, any scientist, scientist should be able to say, hey, um, and you need a man and you know, a woman to come together to be able to have children. So God put that naturally within us to have that attraction so that we would come together and that we would have children. But anything that's un, an unnatural affection is this an affection that just gratifies the soul that doesn't fit that model, okay? So the Bible talks about in Romans 1, obviously, you know, the attraction from a man to a man or a woman to a woman, or even, I would say, a man to an animal. Leviticus talks about that, or a woman to an animal. That's an unnatural affection. That's an inordinate affection. That's not an ordinary. It's not normal. Uh, an, an attraction to, uh, for an, a grown adult to have an attraction to a child who can't even produce children. I mean, you know, they can't even be productive in that way, but they just have this unholy desire to fulfill their flesh with a child. That's unnatural for sure. Okay. And that's, uh, and so there's certain ramifications in the Bible that say, Hey, you got to keep that desire within the marriage relationship. And from that, you know, if there's any, if there's no restraints, and that, that says, hey, this is one man, one woman, one lifetime. If you don't put those restraints and that rule on that, then everybody just does whatever they feel like doing. 
And this is what you have in the very beginning. Uh, instantly, you got polygamy with Lamech, and you've got uh, it going leading up to chapter six, where you see uh, Noah in the flood. What happens? Well, a man just chooses whichever women that, you know, the sons of men, I mean, sons of God, these were saved people who said, hey, we'll just take all the daughters that we find attractive, that we want to ourselves. And, uh, and this is why the context, it doesn't make sense for those who believe that the sons of, of God are angels because it doesn't even fit the context. The context is very clear. Just these men who should know better, who should be you know, following God's uh, mandates that he set for them. Instead, they just go after and fulfill the flesh. And then they just go after whatever women. And then there's what follows that is all kinds of wickedness, violence, and evil, and, and all this. Well, think about it. I mean, if all of a sudden you're just taking whatever woman that you want or you're taking somebody, a woman that belongs to another man, there's going to be violence, right? Anytime there's the lust of the flesh, like James talks about, there's going to be wars, you know, uh, inside of them. So wars and fighting and all that. So the world became wicked and it's, it's always had a tendency to be bad and to have corruption based on the fact that people uh, can't control that natural desire that's within them. Now, the, the desire is not wrong. It's just that the desire is supposed to be fulfilled a certain way. You get married and then you have that relationship and you're stuck with that one person to be the person that can fulfill that, that need in you. And this is what the Bible made very clearly. So I talked about that yesterday and then we talked about you know, what happens when somebody commits fornication and then how we would deal with somebody who committed fornication. Now, I believe the Bible makes it clear that somebody who does commit fornication, which by the way, fornication means just having, having sex before marriage, okay? Uh, and I know sex isn't a biblical word and I hope it doesn't make anybody more uncomfortable than it needs to, but I just don't have other words to use except fornication. In this case, okay, fornication is just when people have that relationship before they're married. They're not married yet, and they do that. And the Bible would say then at that point, the recommendation would be that they get married. Now, if they don't get married, it may, you know, maybe the the father of the of the woman says, no, you're not gonna marry her, and then he just forbids that or whatever, uh, you know, then that's, a, that's another subject. The Bible deals with that, and I talked about that a little bit in yesterday's sermon. So today, what I wanna talk about is adultery and re remarriage, but I'll just say this, adultery and then divorce and remarriage, okay? And then we'll talk about that because I think it flows with all of this, okay? So now, in order to avoid fornication, the Bible says, let a man have his wife, okay? And, uh, and a wife have her husband. And so then, in the confines of that marriage, the Bible says everything's fine. There's no restraints. Like, you know, if somebody came to me and started talking about, you know, certain things they do in the bedroom and asked if it was okay or not. Hey, I don't want to know. Don't tell me. All right. That's between you and your wife and all this. Here's go to Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13. And here's what the Bible says in verse four. It says, marriage is honorable in all and the bed undefiled. Sorry, people still turning. I want you to look at it. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4. Don't worry if you're still flipping pages. I'm usually the last one to find it. <laughs> Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled. But whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. People that go around and they sleep around with other people and they don't stay within the confines of what God set for them, God's going to judge them. Okay, and uh, and he will judge them accordingly, and he is the just, he is the uh, perfect judge. <clears throat> okay, so a definition that I found uh, that I really like, and I, I think it said back to like the 1500s or something like that where this definition came from. It wasn't the 1828 that I normally go to, but I like this definition. It said that adultery is a voluntary violation of the marriage bed. And this is, goes right in line with this here. So the marriage bed is honorable. Marriage is honorable in all things, bed undefiled. But whoremongers and adulterers, those who would go outside of the confines of marriage, it says that God will judge them. 
Okay, so obviously God doesn't like it when we take something that he's given us and we just kind of throw it to the side and we just decide to go do things our own way. Guess what that's called? That's like not being thankful to God and that's stealing from God. That's stealing something. And I said this yesterday for somebody who would commit fornication and they wouldn't wait till marriage and they would have sex with somebody that is actually robbing something special that God gave uh, a man and a wife, and that's robbing from him and taking that from him. And then if they would go even, you know, if God would allow that they had a child from that, you know, I've heard people that justified their sin and said, you know, well, God gave me this child. Are you going to tell me that it was wrong for me to do what I did? And then God gave me this child. No, look, God gave you that blessing. God gave you that gift. A child is, is a reward, the Bible says. And, 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 you know, for those who have come together and done that, but, you know, for someone to take a, somebody to get a child in sin, they've robbed from God and they've stolen something that is great. And there's nothing that, you know, they can they can't undo that. They've already committed that sin. So even if someone in fornication goes ahead and gets remarried, I mean, they get married. There was still they, they, they started their marriage on something that was bad. And today people don't look at it that way. Today, people think, you know, hey, before you get married, you know, you got to kind of play the field a little bit and test drive the car and all this. I mean, this is the kind of stuff people say all the time because you're going to be stuck with that person. But then they're not even really stuck with them because if they don't like them in a couple months or a couple years, they just divorce them and they get remarried. And, you know, you think, well, yeah, but certainly not in the church. You know, if you look at the statistics of uh, people out there who are divorced and remarried, it's no different. I, this surprised me the first time I studied this, but it's no different in the church than it is out in the world. In fact, in some cases, there might be more divorced and remarried people in the church just simply because the church still believes in marrying. <laughs> and people in the world a lot of times said, hey, why even get married? You know, let's just go ahead and live together and do all those kinds of things. And so the world has just kind of thrown out God's plan for mankind. And of course, even to the extent that now, Hey, man with man, women with women, who cares? Like this is just a vile, this is just a vile sin because people just take their uh, feelings and, uh, and, and want to gratify the flesh without thinking about the boundaries which God put, put on us. And so uh, it shows that we're not thankful and don't care about God when God's gifts whenever we just go ahead and flippantly uh, ignore them. Look at Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20, here's the Ten Commandments, which is basically just kind of like an overview, kind of a cliff's notes of all the commandments in the law of God. These are like the big headings, if you will, of all of these things. So here's how God feels about these different things. He starts off giving uh, five uh, basically commands that deal with our relationship with God. You know, don't, don't have any other gods. Don't make graven images. Don't take the name of the Lord in vain. Remember the Sabbath day. Okay, and then it gives in verse 11, I mean, in verse 12, it says, Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord God giveth thee. Now, you know, there, this is, again, this is like the, uh, the main categories of all the laws in the Bible. So if you break down some of the laws, that God put upon people who don't honor their parents. You know, there's some, there's actually some cases where a child could be put to death because of the way that they disrespected their parents or hit them or, or, or cursed them or whatever. Uh, now I'm not talking about just little kids that are still in training. You know, <laughs> I'm talking about like grown people who have showed that they have no respect for their parents or whatever, that God actually put the death penalty upon that. Why? Because God gave you those parents. There's nothing you could have done about it. And for you to be like, hey, well, I didn't want these parents, and so I'm not thankful for those, and I'm just going to curse them and reject them and not obey them or whatever, that's a sin against God. And God hold, held that very seriously because these people were just took a gift that God gave them and said, who cares about you, God? And so that was very uh, a, a, a very big deal to God that people... Uh, obey these commandments. Notice this, that verse, look at verse uh, 13, okay? So now God is going to give commandments regarding our relationship with mankind. Now, I believe that the reason that mother and father, honor, obey your mother, mother and father is in the first category 
You know, and some might put it in the second category. I know that your Bible probably has a new paragraph uh, mark there that's not inspired. It's just somebody put that there. Uh, but verse 12, I don't think it starts a new category. I think honor your father and the mother went with the first category. Now he's going to deal with our, I hope that's making sense what I'm saying. Is everybody pretty much following me? Okay, now he's going to deal with our relationship with mankind, our fellow brothers and sisters. Thou shalt not kill is number one. Notice right in between thou shalt not kill and thou shalt not steal is thou shalt not commit adultery. Right? I think that's interesting. It's like, it's like almost in order, like, hey, don't kill anybody and don't steal anybody. And you know what's right in between, like kind of like stealing from somebody and kind of like killing them is, is, is having adultery with them. Okay. And so, uh, so, you know, you're basically stealing. This person is married. They're supposed to be one flesh. And so you're actually taking a part of their flesh away from them. And this is how God feels about adultery. He wanted us to be the, you know, a, a spouse, a man and a woman together for one lifetime. And that was it. That's, that's, the, that's the, the way that God designed it. And so to be with somebody else, God feels like that is a, that's a terrible thing. And that's stealing from somebody who that person was meant to be with for a lifetime. And again, something that people today, even in even Christians, even in churches, they don't think of it as being that serious of, of a thing, but it is. So we're talking about adultery. The most obvious example in the Bible of adultery, somebody, what do you think it is? It's got to be David and Bathsheba. That's the most obvious. If you say adultery, people think David and Bathsheba. In fact, I was just telling Brother Justin a few minutes ago when we were talking, I said, you know, when I think of David, most people, when they hear David, they think, oh, yeah, the giant killer. This is, you know, just brave young uh, shepherd boy and all this stuff. I can't. I can't help but, in fact, just because of my studies that I've done. And one time I, I was studying and I was preaching on, uh, on my call. And as I studied that, I was like, I don't like David. I just all of a sudden didn't like David. Everything I saw in there, I'm like, he sinned Bathsheba. He killed his most faithful, uh, uh, one of his very faithful servants, you know, soldiers. And he had him put to death. And then he treated Michal bad, who was given to another man. And he was loving her and he was taking care of her. But then David was like, you know what? I'm going to take my wife back. And so finally, she's just looking at him. And you can understand when she's looking out the window, he's jumping around and praising the Lord because the ark is back in Jerusalem. And she's like... Uh, she just despised. Look at him just jumping around out there. And, uh, and she was she was in sin there. I believe that. But when I read that, I have compassion on her. And I'm just like, yeah, but he was the one who treated her wrong. She had a right to be there and be bitter towards him and all that stuff. So I look at the story of David and I get mad at David. And I'm like, I'm like, man, why did God love David so much? Until I read about how he dealt with the fact that he was caught in his sin, he had to pay for his sin before God and before all these different people, he did them wrong. And then, and then I read that story where I always forget his name, but he's getting stones thrown at him and he's just like, you know what, let him throw stones because it could be that God told him to throw stones at me because I'm a wicked person basically is what he's saying. All right. And so I'm like, okay, well, this is why God loved him because he, you know, even though he sinned and he sinned terribly, but God still saw his heart on that. So let's look at the life of David for a minute. 2 Samuel 11. 2 Samuel 11. Wait, product placement. Don't want to advertise for Nestle. I'm just kidding. 2 Samuel chapter 11. And it came to pass after the year was expired at the time when kings go forth to battle that David sent Joab and a servant with him and all Israel. And they destroyed the children of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. But David tarried still at Jerusalem. And it came to pass in an evening tide that David arose from off his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman washing herself. And the woman was very beautiful to look upon. And David sent and inquired after the woman, and one said, Is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife excuse me, of Uriah the Hittite? Now look, David, should, he should have stopped the moment that he saw somebody bathing herself. Okay, But if that wasn't enough, you know, when he says, Hey, you know what? Go get this woman for me, because I'm the king. 
And they said, oh, by, by, by the way, she's the wife of, he should have been like, oh, I'm sorry. You know, at the very least, uh, by that point, he should have been like, hey, this, she's not the one for me. But here's what he does. He's the king. He's got the power. He can fulfill his flesh and do whatever he wants, he thinks. And so David sent messengers and took her, and she came in unto him, and he lay with her, for she was purified from her uncleanness, and she returned unto her house. And the woman conceived and sent and told David and said, I am with child. And David sent to Joab, saying, Send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. And, you know, the story goes on here a little bit. I'll skip this part. But basically, Uriah shows that he's loyal and he's faithful. And he's like, hey, you know, my fellow soldiers are dying in battle. And you got me here. You're just like offering me food and telling me I can go be with my wife, which he's hoping that he'll do so that he can say, oh, like she's with child from him. And he's just trying to hide and to cover up his sin. And, uh, and so basically uh, what David ends up doing, look at verse 23, is he has Uriah killed. Uh, so uh, verse 23, and the messenger, let's see, and the messenger said unto David, surely the men prevailed against us and came out unto us in the field. And we were upon them ev uh, even unto the entering of the gate and the shooters shot from off the wall upon the, thy servants and some of the king's servants be dead. And thy servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. And David said unto the messenger, now he's dead because David sent him in the heat of battle. He knew, this, he knew that they, he would die in this battle. There was a no-win situation. Thus shalt thou say, so here's David telling his messenger, thus shalt thou say to Joab. Now Joab is the one that he told to go put him in the, in the heat of battle. He says, let not this thing displease thee, for the sword devoureth one as well as the other. Make thy battle more strong against the city and overthrow it and encourage thou him. So he's saying, hey, don't be discouraged. People die in battle all the time. It wasn't your fault. Just go on about your, your business. And I feel like from that day forward, Joab had no respect in David. And so he becomes actually an enemy of David. And he kind of teams up with his enemies and he goes against him later on in the story. And I feel like much of that was because he saw how David was handling this. Hey, go get me that woman, right? She, hey, that woman is, is the wife of, of Uriah. Well, that's okay. Bring her to me. You know, and then, you know, oh, go ki kill his, go, go kill her husband, you know, basically is what he's saying. And so you can see where Joab follows his instructions and he's loyal to his king, but he really has no respect for him after this, okay? And so, uh, so this is what happened in this, it, because of this uh, sin of David. But look at chapter 12. And go to verse 13. Well, let's, let's, I want to read the whole section here of uh, Nathan's conversation. So back up to verse 7. And Nathan said to David, Thou art, uh, no, we got to go farther back. Oh, man. I really don't want to just, we got to do this. Let's start at the beginning. And the Lord sent Nathan unto David and he came unto him and said unto him, there were two men in one city and one rich and the other poor. The rich man had exceeding many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing save one little ewe lamb, which he had brought, uh, which he had bought and nourished up. And it grew up together with him and with his children and did eat of his own meat and drank of his own cup and lay in his bosom, and was unto him as a daughter. Now, God's having Nathan say this to David. Now, David was a shepherd, and he loved his sheep. You know, he understood what it was like. You know, I'm not an animal lover. You guys that have dogs and stuff, you probably understand it. I don't, but he used this because David understood, hey, this is my favorite. You know, in this story, he's picturing himself, my favorite lamb, you know, and uh, eats at my own table. I never understood people that let their dogs eat at their table, but anyway. And there came a trap, sorry, because I know you do. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> you know, okay, good. I'm just teasing. And there came a traveler unto the rich man, and he spared to take his own flock and of his own herd to dress for the wayfaring man that was uh, come unto him, but took the poor man's lamb and dressed it for the man that was come to him. And David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. And he said to Nathan, As the Lord liveth, the man that hath done this thing shall surely die. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. And of course, that was a, all a parable illustration to show David like, hey, that's what you're doing only in some ways much, much greater. 
in a lot of ways much, much greater. Verse 7, And Nathan said unto David, Thou art the man. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I anointed thee king over Israel, and I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul, and I gave thee thy master's house and thy master's wives into thy bosom. Concubines is kind of what they were. And gave thee the house of Israel and of Judah. And if that had been too little, I would moreover have given thee, uh, uh, given thee such and such things. Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword, and hast taken his wife to be thy wife, and hast slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from thine house, because thou hast despised me, and hast taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against thee out of thine own house, and I will take thy wives before thine eyes, and give them unto thy neighbors, and he shall lie with thy wives in the sight of the sun. Uh, for thou didst it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the sun. And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, The Lord also hath put away thy sin, thou shalt not die. Howbeit, because by this deed thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child also that is born unto thee shall surely die. And Nathan departed out of his house, and the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife bare unto David, and it was very sick. David therefore besought God for the child, and David fasted and went in and lay all night upon the earth. And of course, you know the story, the child ends up dying. And that's another example that God forgave, but God still was the final judge. And God still was the one who said, I'm going to make sure that he pays for this sin. And, uh, and he says, I've put away thy sin. In other words, I'm, you know, I, I, I've forgiven you for that, but yet he still had to deal with it. Okay, so... How does somebody, knowing that this is such great of a sin and has such devastating uh, impact on people, uh, you know, how does a married person avoid adultery? Let me give you a few examples. If you're married in here, you need to, uh, you need to think about this. Proverbs chapter 5. Because we would all, all married men and, and women, we would all like to think, hey, I could never be tempted to commit adultery. You know, I, I feel like that in my heart. I feel like I would never be tempted. But you know what? I, I do know my human nature. I do know uh, that the flesh is weak. And so I've got to avoid any possibilities of there being a temptation there uh, because something could happen. And then I could give in to that temptation of the flesh and just totally mess up my life, my family's life, and everybody around me, you know, the... It, it, it just goes down, it just like snowballs, and it just affects so many people. Look at Proverbs chapter 5, and start in verse 15. <clears throat> Drink waters out of thine own cistern, and running waters out of thine own well. Let thy fountains be dispersed abroad, and rivers of water in the streets. Let them be only thine own, and not strangers with thee. Let thy fountain be blessed and rejoice with the wife of thy youth. Now we know who he's talking about, drinking cisterns out of your own well. It's a euphemism here for, uh, for your wife. Let her be as a loving hind and pleasant roe. Let her breast satisfy thee at all times, and be thou ravished always with her love. And why wilt thou, my son, be ravished with a strange woman and embrace the bosom of a stranger? Okay, so one way that somebody avoids adultery as a married person is just find the fulfillment and find the, the love. And, and this is the gift that God gave you, you know, is with your wife. And so you must find, uh, you know, that fulfillment in her. And this is why the Bible talks about, you know, in first Corinthians seven, which I talked about a little bit yesterday, um, you know, we're supposed to, uh, you know, fulfill each other's needs. And in fact, it says, like, don't defraud one another. You know, there should always be, there, you know, it should be able to at any time stress to, thy, to your spouse, you know, uh, that you're, you're needing that fulfillment, you know, that natural desire that's in you. You're needing that fulfillment. And you should be able to, uh, to, to 
have that fulfilled in, in your life. And, that's, and the Bible's very clear on that. It's a little sensitive and weird subject to talk about in church, but it's right in the Bible. Okay, and it's very clear that when you do that and you find your, that love and that affection in your wife, that'll help you to not seek after any things, uh, after, other, uh, after other women. Now, you know, think about this. Like, this is our natural tendency when we get something and you know i always think about gifts i think about i think about christmas time okay and so you you know how many times as a child you wanted something so bad and then you got it and it was a present and uh, you know that you got for christmas or your birthday or something like that and you're like oh this is the greatest thing in the world and like a week goes by and all of a sudden like you're wanting something else <laughs> a, a old saying the grass is greener on the other side whatever like you just all of a sudden like want don't let that happen to you you know, fall in love with the gift that God gave you. And if things like start getting rough, if you're having a rough time and there's fighting and there's all there's tension, hey, find a way to work it out or find a way to uh, to live with it, because this is the gift that God gave you. And the more that you submit to that and say, God, I want I want to honor you in this marriage, the more wonderful the marriage is going to be. Very important to God that you uh, you fulfill, I mean, you, that you stay within the bounds of that marriage. That's why it's important that you really make sure before you get married that you're marrying the right person. I like how Job said this. Uh, here's another thing that we need to do uh, that David didn't do, and that is keep your eyes to yourself, okay? Keep your eyes to yourself. Job 31.1 says, Job said, I made a covenant with, my, uh, with mine eyes. Why then should I look upon a maid? You know, don't let the eyes wander and start looking because then that thought, you know, here's all the Bible just talks about sin. You see something and then you desire it and then you take it. So like as soon as you see it, turn your head and uh, make a covenant with your eyes uh, not to look upon a maid. And this is why Jesus said in Matthew 5, 28, But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. You know, it's funny that the uh, Proverbs 5, did we read Proverbs 5? Yeah, that's the one, uh, uh, drink waters out of thine own sister and all that. Okay, All that writing there, guess who wrote that? Who wrote Proverbs? Solomon, right? Doesn't that seem kind of hypocritical? Like Solomon, drink waters out of your own sister. Why do you have a thousand wives, you know? 300 wives and 700 concubines. It's like you practice what you preach, you know? Maybe he's telling his sons because he knows the mistakes that he made and he's trying to uh, uh, tell them to avoid doing that. But here's the thing. We often criticize, you know, this message, I, I don't really have anything in here on pornography, but let me just say this. Oftentimes we criticize uh, Solomon for having a thousand wives. Now, if it's true that if looking on a wife, I mean, looking on a woman to lust after her is committing adultery with her in your own heart, there are a lot of people who have been addicted to pornography in their life who've had a lot more wives than, <laughs> than, uh, uh, than that, or, or maybe close to that. Okay. And so, but I, I, you know, obviously Jesus is making a point here, but I think all of us would admit that a hey, looking at some, someone and not physically being with that person is different. Now he's making a point. He's saying, look in your heart, you've already gone that don't even let it get to the heart. That's why what's the 10th commandment. Thou shalt not covet. You know, after that neighbor's wife or that neighbor's house or anything, don't covet, okay? Uh, it's not that it's the same as committing adultery. It's not the same as stealing. It's not, but it's the first step. And so Jesus is saying, don't even go that far. We need, we need to make a covenant with our eyes that we wouldn't look upon a maid. And of course, most of the Bible is written towards, uh, from the perspective of men. And I hope women in here can read that and, and understand that it applies to them as well. But most of the instructions are men preaching to men, it seems like, in the Bible. All right, so we talked about adultery. Now let's talk about divorce and remarriage. Because <clears throat> here's what somebody will say. They get into a married relationship, which is God, which is God honoring. I mean, if they chose the wrong spouse, it's still God honoring to be with them, if, if possible. Okay, but uh, but oftentimes this will be this will happen. But what if my spouse, you know, cheated on me? What if my spouse hates God? You know, should I stay with them even though they hate God? What if my spouse abuses me? What if my spouse hates me? What if my spouse abused my kids? Now, look, I believe there are certain situations where my advice to 
a woman, for instance, who's being abused or children being abused or whatever was, would be like, get, get away from the person, right? Get away from them and, and maybe, you know, find somebody you can trust. Maybe you can work something out. That's just my, I'm just saying, like, I wouldn't want to see any woman. I wouldn't want to see any children abused. Say, hey, you know, split up for a minute and get safe, get, get sa uh, find safety. But that's not what people are usually looking for. And a lot of times they're exaggerating abuse. They're exaggerating, you know, my husband doesn't love me. They're exaggerating, you know, the fact that, you know, they say, oh, he's cheating on me. Maybe they meant he's like looked at pornography or something like that. And, and it's like they, they exaggerate that because what they want you to be able to say is, okay, well, you know what? You go marry somebody else. But that's not what we find in the Bible. So many will justify divorce and remarriage and thereby they try to excuse the fact that they left their spouse, right? The person that God said, okay, you naturally have a desire within you to be with another person. So here's the person I gave you, bone of your bone, flesh of your flesh. You know, uh, you two should be one flesh. Therefore shall man leave his mother and his father, cleave to his wife, and they should be one flesh. Okay, this is what God intended. You know, this is your, this is your wife, just like Adam and Eve. But people will justify and say, well, you know what? It didn't work out with that person, so now I'm in this relationship because that person was unfair to me or they were, they were whatever. The Bible doesn't give an allowance to be with another person, okay? Because when you're with another person, guess what that is? That's adultery. Now, people don't want to admit that. They don't want to say that that's the case, uh, and they'll try to find ways to explain exceptions to that. But I'm going to tell you, I do not believe, just so you know where I stand uh, and what I teach, I do not believe that there's ever a reason for somebody to get uh, divorced and then remarried. And I'm going to try to explain that here from the Bible. <clears throat> now, I've, with a certain situation that we got going on that we'll talk about after, uh, after the sermon, I thought about getting a whole bunch of advice from other pastors. And here's what I thought in my head. I'm almost 100% sure what every pastor would say. But then I was like, but you know what? It'd be almost like a situation like Micaiah. <laughs> you know, like the 400 prophets are like, yeah, go up, go up. And, I'm, and, and, and it's like, you know, it's not so much important what these other pastors say. I need to know what's right before God based on, on, God, on God's word. Because there's a lot of pastors out there that have a completely different view than I do on divorce and remarriage. And here's what a lot of pastors will say. In fact, you can see sometimes on their statement on their website, it'll say, we don't believe in divorce and remarriage unless it was adultery or abandonment. Have you ever heard that? Adultery or an abandonment. That's the big things that they'll, they'll say. Okay, so let's look at a few verses in the Bible. Now, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, I don't think it's in John, but Matthew, Mark, and Luke all quote this twice in Matthew, actually, uh, where Jesus talks about this. But let's go to Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10. Again, I might go a little long, and then we got some business to cover after the sermon, but I hope you're, you're following and you're in it for the long haul. Mark chapter 10, start in verse 2. And the Pharisees came to him and asked him, of course, they're trying to trip up Jesus. Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife? Tempting him. That's, they were tempting him. That's why they asked him this question. And he answered and said unto them, what did Moses command you? And they said, Moses offered to write a bill of divorcement and to put her away. Which let me just say this. I'm going to try to show, this, show you this a little bit in a minute. That's actually not what Moses said. Okay. Now the Talmud, uh, where the Jews began to create their own laws and add to the word of God, they started to say, hey, you can put away your wife for any cause. But that's not what the verses say where, where Moses says to give a bill of divorcement. We'll look at that in, in a minute. He said, Moses suffered to write a bill of divorcement and to put her away. And Jesus said, un, uh, answered and said unto them, for the hardness of your heart, he wrote you this precept, but from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female, and for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. And then, uh, so then, were no more twain but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. And in the house his disciples asked him again of the same manner, and he said unto them, Whosoever shall put away his wife and marry another committeth adultery against her. 
And if a woman shall put away her husband and be married to another, she committeth adultery. So that's very specific. I think that's very point blank. There's no way to get around that. If God wants marriage to be one man and one woman for one lifetime, then anything outside of that is against his plan. So some would say that a person can remarry again for adultery or uh, abandonment. Where do they get that? Here's where they get that. In the passage where Jesus says, uh, you know, that they, uh, a man shall be, let's go to, uh, let's go to Matthew 1 actually. Where Jesus says, save for the cause of fornication. Modern translations will say, save for the cause of adultery. Okay, because this is what men kind of impose upon the scripture and they put that there and said, it must mean adultery. But it's not what it says. It says, save for the cause of fornication. All right. So if you don't have a King James and if it doesn't say fornication, I, it's wrong. Okay, because that's not what the Bible says. <clears throat> this is referencing something that happens before the marriage is consummated. Okay. And so you have to kind of understand the process back in Bible days uh, of the marriage, they would be espoused to somebody or engaged to somebody, and they would go through that engagement however long it took before the actual consummation of the, uh, of the marriage, you know, where they would actually have sex become one flesh and kind of seal the deal. Okay, and so through that engagement process, you know, they might assume everything's fine. We're going to we're going to get married. You know, I'm a virgin. She's a virgin. Everything's going to be fine. But then when they got closer to the time, the man finds out that the wife wasn't a virgin. OK, because she must have committed fornication. Right. That's the only reason that she wouldn't be a virgin, hopefully. And so uh, so therefore there is an exception made where the husband can put away the wife. Look at uh Look at Matthew chapter 1. I thought I was there. You're familiar with the story of Joseph and Mary at the birth of Jesus. Now, here's a guy that finds out his wife is with child. Now, they haven't come together and consummated their marriage yet. They're still in this spousal state. They're still engaged to one another. Okay, And then he finds out she's with child. That's a tough one to explain, <laughs> okay? And then she starts saying, oh, no, no, no. I'm a child of the Holy Ghost. Like, I've never been with another man, but I just have a child in there. And, and, and Joseph's like, nice try, you know what I mean? But I'm not buying it. And so here's what happens, Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. So you see there, he even called her your wife, because it was his wife, but they hadn't come together yet. So they hadn't consummated their marriage, and so... The idea was that when he found out that she wasn't a virgin, he said, I can't marry her. So he was going to put her away. But he was showing mercy and saying, look, I don't want to, I'm not like going to make a big deal about it. Of course, they're under Roman, Roman law at that time anyway. They're not under the, uh, the Jewish law necessarily. So I don't think that they, I don't think he could have brought her before the elders and had her stoned or something like that. And in fact, you know, I believe there was a loud for mercy. Uh, even within the Old Testament law, and that's why we see so much mercy was given, especially uh, even God gave David mercy. Okay, we'll talk about that here in a minute. So J Joseph said, you know what, I'm just going to put her away. I don't want her to be, you know, put to death or embarrassed or, or made a big scene, and so I'm just going to put her away. I don't know what he thought people would think, maybe even about him. They might think that it was his child and then he abandoned I don't know what they would think, but he's, uh, he's trying to do the right thing. Now, now, where did he get this idea? Go back to Deuteronomy 24. And now we're getting into the verses that Jesus was talking about when he said, save for the cause of fornication. Deuteronomy 24. Uh, 
a man hath taken a wife and married her, and it come to pass that she find no favor in his eyes because he has found some uncleanness in her, then let him write her a bill of divorcement and give it in her hand and send her out of his house. And when she has departed out of his house, she may go and be another man's wife. That's between her and the other man. Okay. Uh, but, but this is not, but he has the ability to put her out. And if the latter husband hate her and write her a bill of divorcement and give it in her hand and send her out of his house, or if the latter husband die, which he took her, uh, which took her to be his wife, her former husband, which sent her away, may not take her again to be his wife after that she is defiled. So in other words, if, you know, she was, uh, you know, if she, if she had consummated the marriage or whatever, then the next, the husband couldn't, uh, couldn't take her back. Now go to, let's see here, chapter 22, go back a little ways to chapter 22. And look at verse 13. If a man take a wife and go in unto her and hate her and give occasion. Now, look, you got to understand hate. Hate doesn't always mean exactly like you think. It's not like he just despised her and didn't want anything to do with her. No, he, he, he you know, he doesn't he doesn't love her because of uh, it's either love or hate in the Bible. Sometimes it's hard to tell, like the variations in between those two. OK, but he, if if he hates her, uh Verse 14, and give occasion of speech against her and bring up an evil name upon her and say, I took this woman and when I came to her, I found her not a maid. Then shall the father of the damsel and her mother take and bring forth the tokens of the damsel's virginity unto the elders of the city in the gate. Like that's a cultural thing that I can't even exactly explain. I kind of have some ideas, uh, but I won't even try to explain it. And the damsel's father shall say unto the elders, I gave my daughter unto this man to wife. And he hateth her, and lo, he hath given occasions of speech against her, saying, I found not thy daughter a maid, and yet these are the tokens of my daughter's virginity. And they shall spread the cloth before the elders of the city, and the elders of the city shall take, the, uh, take that man and chastise him, and they shall immerse him in a hundred shekels of silver, and give them unto the father of the damsel, because he hath brought up an evil name upon the virgin of a virgin of Israel, and she shall be his wife. He may not put her away all of his days. Now, look, when I read that, I always think this. I'm like, I don't think that woman would want to be his wife after that. <laughs> you know what I mean? After she's made, he's making a false accuse, accusation against her and clearly doesn't want to marry. But this is this is the case because, uh, you know, I think. Uh, well, anyway, there's a lot more I can say about that. But you understand the idea. These are the law, the types of laws that Jesus is referencing when he says, save for the cause of fornication. Uh, I believe the Bible is very clear that you don't put the you don't put the spouse away and then remarry okay now is there ever a time that a spouse can leave another spouse and by god they're not wrong for doing that as long as they stay uh they don't remarry and i would say of course yes i already talked about hey i would suggest in an abusive situation that they separate not that they will remarry but they would just separate you say well that just doesn't seem fair Look, I'm just going by what God wants. God doesn't want there to be a disloyalty and there to be with more than one person in that way. Uh, he wants you to stay within the confines of marriage and he hates divorce and he would rather not divorce. But if you must uh, divorce, then just stay uh, unmarried with the exception of death. Of course, when somebody dies, you're no longer under under that uh, that bondage. That person's dead. OK, so there's no conflict there. <clears throat> now. What about this idea of abandonment that people talk about? Look at uh, look at math. Let me see here. Look at First Corinthians seven. First Corinthians seven. And here's where they get that idea because here's what Paul says to the church at Corinth. Now remember the beginning of verse 7 is clear what he's talking about is fornication uh, and, and sexual sin. So he says, now concerning things whereof you wrote unto me, it's good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. Okay, look at verse 10. 
And unto the married I command, yet not I, but the Lord, let not the wife depart from her husband. But and if she depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband, and let not the husband put away his wife. Speak I, not the Lord. So he's saying, I know it's under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost that it's in here, but he's saying like, well, now what I'm going to say, there's no real law that God gave us. I'm just telling you my opinion, basically what he's saying. If any brother hath a wife that believeth not, right? She's not a Christian. She just, she, she hates the Lord, but you got saved and you want to follow the Lord and she wants to go do something else. And she be pleased to dwell with him. Let him not put her away. And the woman which hath an husband that believeth not, and if he be pleased to dwell with her, let, let her not leave him. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else were your children unclean, but now they are holy. But if the unbelieving depart, let him depart. A brother or a sister is, is not under bondage in such cases, but God hath called us to peace. All right, but here's where people go wrong. As they say, see right there, if there's abandonment, then you're not under bondage. And so you can remarry. But it doesn't ever say that you can remarry. In fact, it flat out says to stay single. Not to mention, Paul just says, hey, this is my advice, but not necessarily God. I mean, there's so many things about this that make that a weird thing to say. Like all of a sudden, hey, if someone leaves you, you can just, you're just free to remarry. It doesn't say that. Uh he says, uh, you're not under bondage. In other words, like, yeah, don't like, what are you going to do? Hold on to their, you know, legs and just say, no, don't leave me. Don't leave me. It's just like, let them leave. Let them leave. It's unfortunate, but that's the situation that you're in. And then you have to uh, remain unmarried at that point. Now, look, as a pastor, just as a human being, as somebody who has family members who have been divorced and then they're lonely and then they want to get remarried, there's that within me that's very compassionate. And it's like, hey, I don't know what that's like to be alone. I don't know. And I want to say, hey, it's better to, to remarry than to burn. But hey, but that's not the context that's given here. Okay, once that person gets, you know, it is better to marry than to burn. But once you've been married, there's not a reason for divorce and remarriage unless uh, death is involved. And I believe the Bible is very clear on that. There seems to be no case outside of a spouse's death where a person is justified to be with, uh, with more than one person sexually. Are there examples in the Bible where people are? Sure. There's fornication uh, where people just, you know, sleep with other people. There's people that go to harlots. There's people uh, that are involved in polygamy. Hey, well, at least I'm married to them. I'm just married to more than one at, a t at the same time. Uh, which, you know, the Bible makes it clear in as, as far as, this is interesting, but if you read the, Le the Levite, the, I mean, the book of Leviticus, the instructions to the Levites are that nobody in the priesthood can have, uh, you know, can have had somebody else that wasn't like, that was married and divorced, or I can't remember exactly how it says, but they can't, they can't be divorced and the person that's with them can't be divorced. And this was a requirement for somebody in the priesthood. And then it says also is the qualifications of a, of a pastor. It says the husband of one wife. And people will be like, well, that means one wife at a time. Well, <laughs> that doesn't make sense. Like in the context, no, it's very clear that person's been with one person. One person. So what if they died? Hey, honestly, to, just to be completely honest with you, if my wife, I'm not saying necessarily I'd be disqualified from being a pastor. More. Like if my wife died, like what would be the point of, of trying to go on and then find another spouse and then and all that stuff? Because it says you got to be the husband of one wife. So anyway, that brings up all these different questions. But that, that's that's not the, the point. The point is God had, a, a you know, very particular instructions. And the reason he said, hey, the priests, this needs to be the case. The pastors or the elders, this needs to be the case is because they're supposed to set an example for the flock. He knows that in the flock it's going to happen. Are there people in here that have committed or in any church that have committed fornication in the past before they got married, they were with other partners? I, yeah, of course. You know, is there anybody in churches that have been divorced and remarried? Of course. Of course. But it's not right. It's, it's not, it goes against the Bible, but it's, it happens because guess what? We're sinners 
and we have a sinful flesh and we commit sins. And it's not that we don't deal with those sins. It's not that we don't, you know, try to make them right and to say, say, hey, this is a big deal. Uh, this sin has caused all these kind of problems. I mean, there's certain uh, uh, sins that have to be dealt with in the church. And so, you know, whenever we see somebody who's involved in this, you know, we should uh, expect and understand that, hey, we're all sinners. We're going to have bits of these types of sins in every congregation. It doesn't mean that we just take it lightly and say, oh, well, we're all sinners. God forgives. One sin is just as, as, as bad as another sin. No, there has to be judgments that are made. Do we see examples of all these? Of course. But that doesn't mean it's right or that we should treat it as a light thing. So regarding the forgiveness of such a sin, Here's where I stand, and I've searched this in my heart, and I've tried to figure out, like, what is the right thing to do as a church when people are divorced and remarried, or there's adultery that's involved in some case, what do you do? And the Bible makes it clear, like, even if someone's involved in fornication, okay, so we're not talking about adultery, we're talking about fornication, they're supposed to be put out of the assembly, okay, so they're kind of like, they're kicked out until they deal with that, and then they come back repentant, and then we, you can uh, you can be, you can forgive them for that. Regarding it, regarding the forgiveness of uh, of sin such as adultery, and I'll just say that or divorce and remarriage because some people are like oh adultery is wrong, but if they've been divorced and remarried, you know I mean that's not a big deal. I think it's a big deal, and I think if that if someone does that, and you've advised them not to, you showed them in the Bible where it's wrong, and they did that, it needs to be pointed out that they're wrong, and it needs to be dealt with. But in time, can that person? Just move on and say, we sinned, we did wrong, we're going to pay for it, God's going to judge, whoremongers and adulterers, and so He's going to judge us. We've, uh, we've, we've been punished for this, we understand our error, we want to, uh, to be, re, you know, re, we want to be forgiven and, and reunited with our brothers and sisters. Can that happen? I, I believe that it can. Let me just put it this way, if God can forgive David and Bathsheba, who are in the line of Christ, you know what I mean? Who, who Now, did, did, did God just say, you know what? I forgive your sin, David, that's it. I would just act like it never happened. No, thankfully when it comes to our salvation, going to heaven, he's never gonna bring those sins up. That's never going to be resurfaced when we stand before God. Say, well, now let's look back at some of the sins that you committed in this life. Thank God that he's not gonna do that to us. But in this life, are you gonna pay for the sins that you committed? Of course. Of course, and, one, and, and, and if your brothers and sisters in Christ don't punish you, God's still going to punish you. You're still going to pay for it in one way or another. You're gonna, uh, you, it's not going to go so well. I said this uh, in, uh, in Sullivan. I was talking about the relationship of a pastor and all that. But I said this one time I heard somebody say this who had been, now their spouse actually died, and they were lonely, and they were looking for another spouse. And... And, you know, after all these years of being lonely, they just kind of went with the first person, you know, that came along, so to, sort of, so to speak, uh, so to say. And, uh, and that person, this, this was an older lady, and she told her son, who was, a, who was the pastor that was telling the story, and she said, man, I found something that was worse than being alone, and that's being married to the wrong person, okay? And so, uh, you know, when we just make rash decisions trying to gratify the flesh, you know, we, are, we will pay for that decision, but... That's, you know, at the case where a person gets remarried again, was it a sin? Yes. Now, what do you do? Well, you stay with that person and you do right and you don't go find another person. You don't, you don't just continue to, to fall into the same uh, sin that you have committed in the past. All right. But if God can forgive David, I believe obviously we can forgive somebody who is repentant. David was repentant. Now look, now I, I feel like I feel like when somebody comes forward and says, you know, I want to let everybody know, they didn't know this about me, but I've been, I've been guilty of such and such sin, and I'm asking forgiveness for that. It's easier to forgive that person than someone who's just caught in the sin. You know what I'm saying? Like everybody is, everybody's repentant. Like every, every public, like every governor or any like public figure that's ever come out and been caught in some kind of sin, aren't they all repentant? You know what I mean? Like they're all repentant, but it's easier to believe somebody whenever like they just came forward and told you that they were guilty of some sin and they asked for forgiveness. But when Nathan approached David 
He hadn't asked anybody forgiveness. He hadn't even admitted that what he did was wrong, as far as I can tell in the Bible. But then once David confronted him, he said, you know, man, I've sinned. And then he wrote Psalm, oh, what is it, Psalm 51. This is the greatest psalm of ever, uh, our guilt, feel guilty from a sin that you committed. Read that. And, G, and, and, and uh, David calls out and says, restore unto me the joy of my salvation. And he's seeking repentance. And he's asked God for forgiveness. And he's, uh, you know, asked others for forgiveness. So let me say this. In regards to getting forgiveness of a sin, this particular sin of adultery, here are some points that I want to consider. Number one, forgiveness isn't given to someone who's continuing in a sin. Okay. Now in the case of divorce and remarriage, are they continuing in the sin? I suppose that's the argument that could be made. Okay. Well, they got married and so now they're continuing sin. I don't look at it that way. I look at it like they sinned and now, Hey, let's, let's not sin again. Don't get divorced and remarried again. Okay. How many times are we supposed to forgive our brothers, though? You know, 70 times 7? Number two, so, you know, so the, or if someone's going to seek repentance, obviously they need to get to a point where they're not going to continue in that sin. They're going to say, hey, I, I'm not going to do this anymore. I'm sorry for it. I recognize the, the pain that it's caused, and I'm going to move forward from this point on. Number two, in humility, the ones guilty of the sin should accept any discipline put upon them or any ill feelings toward them. You know, here's, here's, well, let me do this. I'm going to finish this list and then we're going to shut off live stream and I'll deal with some personal issues, but let me just uh, continue this list here first. Number three, this includes recognizing that God is the one who's the final judge and who can discipline perfectly. So even when you forget, hey, I'm forgiven by all my brothers and sisters in Christ, I'm restored unto them. Everything's just hunky-dory. Well, not necessarily. You might be paying for the rest of your life. You might have pain and, uh, and things that come your way for the rest of your life. Accept it because you're the one that got yourself into that mess. And so, uh, and so that's not on anybody else. So if somebody else has hard feelings towards you against it, maybe they don't want to treat you exactly like they did before or, or something like that, uh, you got to recognize, hey, this was on me. And I believe David did that. David was a good example of repentance. And even though I still get mad at David whenever I read about the things that he did in the Bible, the, at the end is that he was forgiven, he was restored, but he continued to pay the, the, uh, for the price of the sins that he committed. And finally, I believe that a person in this sense should attempt uh, you know, just to demonstrate the repentance, they attempt some sort of closure uh, should be offered to all parties affected by the sin. Now, let me tell you this. When we commit a sin, uh, and especially a big sin like this that becomes a huge deal, a lot of times when we committed the sin, we thought, we didn't even think about the ramifications of what's going to happen. But in, a particular, in this particular sin, man, we don't understand all the complications that it created. And I'm not just talking about adultery in that sense, but I'm talking about even divorce and remarriage, which I know Jesus said, hey, you've, commit, you've, you've caused them to commit an adultery. But I think we would all agree that it's a little different for somebody to you know, commit adultery while they're in a married relationship than somebody who divorces and then remarried. It's still wrong. The Bible still says it's wrong, but I think we would understand that it does less damage in that, in that, uh, in that case, still wrong though. But I believe that person doesn't even realize how many people it affected. You know, it's going to affect the the two people involved. Of course, it's going to affect their families. It's going to affect their church. It's going to affect you know, man, so many people down the line. The people that were involved previously with them, uh, in their families. I mean, I, I can't even begin to explain who all is going to be affected. All those who looked up. People and saw them as examples in their life. There's a lot of people who are affected by this. And I think if it's that person should admit their fault and just accept the fact that they've sinned and they've caused pain. And, you know what they can to offer some kind of closure to all those people that they may have hurt. And so, uh, and so that's the message. Uh, and that's what I want to, to leave you with. I think that, you know, Marriage, the idea of marriage, the sanctity of marriage, as well as 
fornication and what exactly fornication is and why it's wrong and the lustful feelings that people have, what's natural, what's not natural, uh, the marriage relationship, divorce, remarriage, adultery. All these things have got to be preached because it's serious, serious in God's eyes. And, and a lot of times today people aren't even, uh, they don't take it seriously. And it's just like, hey, you, you just dismiss it like it never happened and everybody just moves on. But it's not possible. People don't move on. Families are affected. People are hurt. And, uh, and just marriage in itself is devalued. You know what I mean? Like look around today, like marriage doesn't even mean anything. That's why people just stopped getting married. Because they look around in society and it's like, well, marriage is nothing. People get married and they get divorced and they even make vows that are just so bizarre now. If you listen to the vows that people make, it's not like, you know, till death do us part and sickness and in health and all this kind of stuff. It's kind of like, you know, well, just until we're no longer married. I mean, it's just like weird, like, you know, because it doesn't mean anything to anymore. But the Bible said, hey, you know, this is a, let no man put asunder, you know, they should be one flesh. So 